Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Thank you, Bill, and good morning, everybody. My name's Don Major, and I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, and I truly, truly am grateful to be here this morning, more so than I usually am giving an AA talk, because I don't have to go back and go to work tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but there are other reasons why I'm, I'm probably more grateful than than usual. And and Lee, thank you so much for whatever misguided uh, reason had you include me with this group because I, 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 I'm truly not kidding. I, I've never been with a, a group of, of people who are so powerful and have been so important in my life. Uh, you guys have got six or seven Saturday night speakers spread out the weekend here, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, what I do know is that I probably can't feel equal to this group, even with divine intervention. <laughs> now, without divine intervention, I don't feel equal to anybody, but I can feel both inferior and smugly superior at the same time, you know. But, but, but even with divine intervention, I'm not sure that I belong in this group. And, uh, you know, I, I've heard the things from, from all these wonderful folks this weekend that I've heard before. And, and I guess if there's one word that I keep hearing and I keep hearing, it's action. It's that what, where we get our benefits is from the action. It's not from learning. And that's so true. By the grace of God, my sobriety dates April 9th of 1981. And I'm not, when I get in trouble today, and God knows I get in trouble. In fact, I've been in a, a, a bad place here lately. Uh, when I get in trouble, it's not some sort of new, sophisticated, spiritual truth that I need to discover that's going to get me out of trouble. What I need to do is go to more meetings, talk to my sponsor, maybe do a little written inventory, do the exact same things that I needed to do when I was 30 days sober. You know, I need to go right back and take that action. And, and I, I want to especially thank uh, this one of the beautiful red-headed women on the uh, front row, Lin, Le, Linda and Bob Vizant, we've known for a long time, and out of the corner of my eye, I started to introduce Linda as my wife this morning. Uh, <coughs> But my wife, Sharon, is the redhead in the teal blue. And, uh, there was talk this weekend about the friends of AA uh, who are not alcoholics. Sharon and I didn't meet until after I was sober. And we have been together 19 years now, been married 18 years. Um, Sharon doesn't need Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, she is more spiritual most mornings when she wakes up than I can get by praying for an hour and a half, doing three pages of gratitude list, and calling four people on the telephone. If I can do that, maybe I can just glide past where Sharon stays most of the time. Uh, there, there are a group of folks that meet at our house um, on Monday nights, uh, and, and Sharon just decided since they're meeting here, this has been going on for years and years, she spends most of Monday baking. The people call it Sharon's Sweets Group. Uh, and I, I was uh, talking with, I think it was Bob, had been down to the usual suspects retreat in uh, Tennessee this year, and two or three years ago, I, I was going down there, and uh, the host committee sent Sharon a dozen roses, and nobody had ever done anything like that before. And a thank you note for sharing, for sharing me for the weekend, like that's some kind of big deal. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, we, we were both moved by it, and we, we got to thinking about it. And at that time, we had been together 16 years. And we calculated that in that 16 years, I had left her about 300 weekends to go do something for Alcoholics Anonymous. And this beautiful woman has never complained, which means she is either a saint, glad to get rid of my butt, or both. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I frequently start my talk by talking about how much divine intervention I need, and, and that is absolutely right. That's the bad news. I need a bunch of divine intervention, 
The good news is I found out that it's pretty easy to get when I'll stick with you folks and with these 12 steps that are a program of recovery. And one place that I talk about needing divine intervention is with regard to the directions. Um, I've always had a really hard time with the directions. Now, um, some of you newer people will be surprised, but those who know and love me understand this. My case is different. Um, it always has been, and, and this little fellow inside me, and he and I are the world's greatest experts on everything. <laughs> Whether we've got any real information or not is totally irrelevant. We're the world's greatest experts on everything, and we also are really worldly. You know, we're practical. We know how the world wags, and, and we know who makes directions. The same people that have always been in charge of directions, Squire John's just button down conservative square johns, anal people. And they're being advised normally by liability insurance lawyers, Jerry, that are worse than they are, for God's sake. And, 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 and we know, of course, the object of directions. It's to manipulate stone idiots into doing things. You know, so obviously they overstate everything terribly. Uh, and, and in a special circumstance like mine, it's necessary to sort of extrapolate uh, in order to figure out what the directions really mean. Um, and I've been very blessed in that regard because it doesn't require any effort. In fact, I'm normally not aware of the process. But I can assure you that without divine intervention, if I look at some directions that say something like, do not exceed six in 24 hours, my brain will register that as really meaning something like, do not exceed 36 in 24 hours. <laughs> so I'm going to need divine intervention there. And, uh, and Lee's made it a little, more, a little more complicated than usual for me because usually the only directions I have to follow is to talk a little bit about what I was like and what happened and what I'm like now. And hopefully, uh, you know, the book gives us another set of directions, and that says that our personal story is telling our own language and from our own point of view how we've been able to form a relationship with our God. So those directions, I've gotten pretty used to, follow, used to following, but Lee tells me now that I'm supposed to talk on steps 10 and 11. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what God does with that one. But uh, I, I'll tell you just a little bit real quick about my story. Some of you have heard it, most of you probably have not. But I, I was born and grew up on a tobacco farm in southwestern Kentucky. The only remarkable thing about my childhood is that it was nothing like I thought it was. Uh, so Sandy was talking about that last night, and, and my capacity for self-delusion is astounding. It's absolutely astounding, and after 28 years, it is unscathed. Uh, without divine intervention, I am as perfectly capable of self-delusion as I was in April of 1981. Uh, until I got sober at 37 years old, I would have passed any lie detector test on earth when I told you the saga. And it wasn't just a story, it was a saga. Uh, and, and my God, it was interesting and romantic. And it was, it was all about how by my iron will and my sterling intellect, I had pulled myself up by the bootstraps from the depths of poverty to those staggering heights I'd reached. And I was so sincere that I would usually have you and me both crying before I was halfway done with it. And, and I wasn't sober a week when I realized that was really a bunch of crap. We weren't even poor. Uh, <laughs> and, in fact, we weren't anywhere close to poor. We were middle-class farming people who had everything we needed and most of the things we wanted. Uh, and as far as the heights go, they were a whole lot more staggering than they were high. Uh, my, my alcoholism is like a hydra. It's just got so many heads that, uh, that I can never count them, and when I cut off one, two grow back, it seems like. So my alcoholism is many, many things, a many splendored things, I've called it. But on those staggering heights and that depths of poverty, one thing that my alcoholism clearly is is a disease of superlatives. And what that means is that without divine intervention, I won't think in terms of even good and bad. An ordinary will never cross my mind. I'll think in terms of best and worst, the absolute extremes of everything. And the truth is that both drunk and sober, I've probably been a whole lot more just plain old ordinary garden variety than my ego's ever been able to stand. Uh, but at any rate, uh, what was really going on when I was uh, a kid in the early part of my life was the selfishness and self-centeredness that the book talks about. Um, I believe my alcoholism begins with that ego disorder. 
that's been with me as far back as I can remember, uh, that obsession with myself, that obsession with how I believe I stack up against other people in this world, letting how I feel now be the most important thing in the universe to me. And I'm still that way today without divine intervention. Without divine intervention, I can give lip service to something being more important than how I feel. I can even act for a little while like something might be more important than how I feel. But if I haven't done what's necessary to let the light shine into my soul, believe me, that's a smokescreen. I will wind up letting how I feel be the most important thing in this universe. And that obsession with myself had the only result that I believe it can have with a human being. Uh, as far as I could back as I can remember, I, I had pain and emptiness inside myself. Uh, I couldn't stand the way I felt inside myself without either running or, or trying to stuff something in there or both. And I made it through the first 12 or 13 years of my life trying to stay a half a step ahead of a screaming fit by by keeping all the balls juggled and the lights flashing and the smoke shooting out and the mirrors doing their job to keep you from seeing what I was and me for having to look at what I was and what I wasn't. I got drunk when I was 12 or 13, same as many, many of us. A lot of trouble, puke, blacked out, uh, woke up the next morning, had a terrible hangover, swore all the Baptists were right and I would never do it again. Uh, couldn't have been more sincere, was fairly effective, was nearly a week till I got drunk the second time. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and the reason I got drunk the second time, same reason I got drunk the 2,000th time, because for a few minutes on my way to puking and so on, I had passed through a right pleasant neighborhood. Uh, that, uh, it, it, for the first time in my life, made me feel good enough inside myself, did something about that pain and that emptiness that that obsession with myself creates, and made me feel good enough inside I could stand it. And since how I feel is the most important thing in the world to me, for the next 25 years, my powerlessness over alcohol and the things like it's a no-brainer because when I wanted to change the way I felt, it didn't matter how much it cost and it didn't matter who it cost because how I feel is the most important thing in the universe. That ego disorder is what made me an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. I was never able to feel okay for anything or anybody but able to feel too good for you and too bad for you at the same time. You know, I've always known that I could do anything, and at the same time, I've always known I couldn't really do anything. Um, it takes the divine intervention to get me where I'm okay for anything or anybody on the face of this earth. I think it was the ego disorder that caused me to have such terrible problems with higher power. I couldn't stand the, the, the my ego couldn't stand the possibility that anything was more important than my brain as far as running my life. It absolutely just rejected the possibility that anything was more important than that. And I believe on account of that ego disorder, I didn't have any teachability or humility whatsoever until I got sober at, at 37 years old, which I did. And by the way, I, I had, uh, despite the raging alcoholism for 25 years, and it raged, uh, I, I never apologized for my drinking. I never told myself or anybody else I was going to have two or three drinks. From the time I, I never wanted two or three drinks, two or three drinks never did anything but make me need something to drink really bad. Uh, from that first drunk until I got sober, alcohol dominated everything in my life. Uh, I, school was extremely easy for me, and I wound up an early admission student in college when I was 16 with a full scholarship. Uh, my reaction to that was to stay so drunk I, I, I lost all concept of day and night, just passing out and coming to. Uh, blew the scholarship, went to work for seven and a half years, worked full-time, drank full-time, went to school full-time, and somehow finished undergraduate in law school. have no idea how that happened. When I look back on those eight years, it's just a whirling gray mass of alcoholic insanity. I don't have a handful of concrete memories of it. Practiced law for 10 years in Louisville from 1968 to 1978, criminal defense law with pretty good little bit of success. Uh, drove a car off the road at 130 miles an hour full of scotch, cocaine, quaaludes, speed, and vodka. Uh, did an awful lot of bad things to my body. Lost my urinary function for a year. Doctors told me I'd never walk again without braces on one or two legs and maybe a cane or two and that I would never pee again. Uh, by the grace of God, I've been sober 28 years and haven't had a brace or a cane for over 29. Uh, and, uh, and, and about a year after the wreck, the head of urology down at Duke University put my plumbing back together and restored my urinary function. Uh, uh, while I was laying in the hospital not thinking that that was going to happen, 
you know, while I was laying in the hospital with that prognosis, my friends would come in and bring me booze and more dope than the doctors were giving me. And I would lay in that hospital bed and say things like, you know, fellas, anybody can quit drinking when the going gets a little tough. But it takes a man to land there with it when the bills start coming in. And then I'd explain to them that a man ought not be out there doing the crime if he's not prepared to do the time. And so they weren't going to hear me whining just because we'd hit a bump in the road. Give me another drink and let's go on with it. Following all that, I, I lost uh, uh, my, my second family. Uh, I had one. My daughter was my only child at that time. I didn't lay eyes on her for over three years. I was in the asylum 18 times in three and a half years. The boys kicked me out of the law firm that I'd founded. State of Kentucky jerked my law license, and for about a year I lived without an address on what I called the street and an expired Blue Cross Blue Shield card. In the fall of 1980, I wound up in Nashville, Tennessee, washed up on the door of an asylum. Stayed in there a month, had no home, no car, teeth rotting out of my head, no clothes. Uh, had a young fellow whose name was Matt. Uh, who was my roommate in that asylum. Um, and uh, I got out of there, and I had no place to go. Uh, I just literally had no place to go. And Matt's family lived in Nashville, not really involved in AA. You know, we stay sober a while, and we get sort of a really, really vague idea that alcoholics have got a monopoly on spirituality. Uh, we really do. I know every once in a while I have to fight the urge to tell Sharon, my God, honey, what do you know about spirituality? You're not even an alcoholic, for God's sake. Uh, and and here, here's what I believe to be the truth of the matter. In 1934 or 5, God took mercy on a bunch of spiritual retardees. And through Bill gave a message so simple that even we can grab hold of a little corner of the wonderful spirituality that people have been enjoying for millennia. But those wonderful people felt sorry for me and said, Don, why don't you come stay with us a few days? And I went and lived with those people for a year. I didn't stay straight uh, for the first six months. Got sober in April of 81, but through some miracles, the big miracle being God giving me the first little bit of teachability or humility I'd ever had in my life the first willingness to do some things that were suggested, even though I didn't understand them, I didn't agree with them, I didn't think they would work, and I certainly didn't want to do them. In other words, God let me take the ultimate veto power in the universe out of my brain. God let me do things for the first time in my life voluntarily that I didn't feel like doing. You see, without divine intervention, I think what I think, feel, and believe is the center of the universe. And if we're going to change me, we've got to find some switches, some knobs inside me to get me adjusted so I think, feel, and believe differently. Right today, if I wake up and don't feel like doing what I know in my heart is that next stitch that God wants me to take in whatever pattern God is making, and I don't feel like it, without divine intervention, it doesn't cross my mind to go ahead and do it anyway. I want to call Bob or Bob or, or Jerry or Joe or somebody and say, I don't feel like going to work. Talk to me. Let, help me. Let, 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 let me talk. No, don't say anything. I want to talk myself well here now. Let me talk about my feelings. Uh, let, let me talk about my feelings so that we can get me fixed so that I feel like going to work. Well, what difference does it make whether I feel like going to work? i got to go to work, for God's sake. But you see, that doesn't occur to me in nature. It, it just absolutely doesn't occur to me. And if you're an alcoholic of my ilk, I've got some terrible news for you right now. I mean, it's bad news. In 28 years sober, I guarantee you, you won't find anybody who has worked more diligently to fix himself inside to make him feel like doing right than me. I have prayed until I was blue in the face for God to come down and fix me inside so I'd feel like doing right. I worried a couple of sponsors to, to perhaps to the grave, aggravating them about what we can do to fix me. I've dominated discussion meetings. I've probably done two feet of, of inventories on it. After I got a little money going, I spent some money on outside counseling going to fix me uh, inside so I'd feel like doing right. And here's the horrible news. In 28 years, not one single time has anything made me feel like doing right except going on and doing right when I don't feel like it. And that's just almost more maturity than I can stand. It's just awful. 
But at any rate, uh, the point of what I was saying is that Sharon and I are going to leave a little early in, in Joe's talk. We have to because we, we've, we, we've got uh, a commitment to be in Lake Placid, Florida this afternoon with the wonderful folks that I lived with a year in, in, in Florida. <laughs> and, uh, and that's just beautiful that I get to get to see them and we have maintained a loving relationship although we haven't seen one another much for 26 years we have maintained a, a loving relationship but at any rate uh, I got my law license back through miracles uh, just as a byproduct of steps eight and nine I uh, never thought I'd get a law license back didn't want a law license back Thought, thought, and oh, I didn't. If I could have gotten a job working uh, uh, at at a, at a convenience store in Nashville at minimum wage, I would never have gone back to Louisville to practice law. I was too scared. And I want to tell you something. I don't think it was paranoia. From 26 years from the time I went back to Louisville, I want to tell you. I think my reasons for not going back to Louisville were sound. <laughs> I believe God poured oil on the troubled waters of my past. Uh, and, and I'm just going to tell you real quickly, and something happened with Step 6 and 7. I love 6 and 7, and Bob is one of my, he, he's one of my true heroes. So many of my heroes are here, but, but, but Bob, Bob Bazan's, uh, was a big piece of my 6 and 7 part. Uh, and, and, and in May of 1990, 19 years ago this month, something began to happen. I began to realize, okay, and, and words are so important to me in sobriety, like realize I thought that was the same thing as knowing something. Hey, realize is a form of the word real. When I have realized something, that literally means it has become real inside me. The stuff I've known for 30 years that I haven't realized. And I began to realize some things about step six and seven that I hadn't before, that it's not where I try to fix myself. I began to realize I don't want any issues because I don't know what to do with issues. And, and, and I've, never, I've never met an issue that didn't fit right squarely into one or more of the three parts of the fourth step. It involves resentment, fear, sex, or some combination of them. And here's the terrible thing. In 28 years sober, I've heard about a whole bunch of issues, and I'm not aware of a single one that is permanently and satisfactorily resolved. So I don't want any issues. I don't know what to do with them. I want character defects, and I know exactly what to do with those. That's come to my God like a little child and say, Mom, Dad, I don't know where we're going or how to get there. But I'm going to try to quit figuring out the pattern and listen to that little spark of the divine in me and take that next stitch. You see, my brain wants to tell me that my job is the pattern. I'm 65 and hadn't figured out a pattern correctly yet. And yet I want to sit around and figure out the pattern so I'll know where to start stitching. It's completely backwards. My job's stitching. And that's the essence of faith to me is to take that next stitch when my brain's screaming, you won't get what you want. You're going to look bad if you take that stitch there, but my heart knows that's the next place to take that stitch and leave that pattern up to God. But at any rate, that in May of 1990, there's some things happened. I was nine years sober, and I'd been a circuit speaker for a while, and I was sponsoring 40 or 50 people, and, and I, really I was, and I was dying inside. Uh, relationships with opposite sex and financial chaos particularly were just absolutely killing me, and I was working so hard on my character defects Whichever one was bothering me and embarrassing me, I'd grab that sucker by the collar, use prayer steps, sponsors, meetings, outside counseling, slam it up against the wall and say, come here, give me a little God, give me a little help, and we'll get rid of it, and God never came. And I didn't know what was wrong. Well, one thing was wrong. Part of my morning meditation every morning is to read 86, 87, 88 in the big book, and I read it right there. Many of us wasted a whole lot of time praying for our own selfish ends, and it doesn't work. You can easily see why took me nine years to realize that when I'm praying for a character defect to be gone because I want it gone, I might as well be praying for a bright red Ferrari because I'm praying for my own selfish ends. What that seven-step prayer really asks God to do is really the essence of all the steps, to take away all the defects of character that stand in the way of my usefulness to God and my fellows, and I hadn't got a clue which ones they are. You see, my problem with perfection is not what I thought it was. I thought it was my inability to attain it, and I certainly am unable to attain perfect perfection. But that never matters. We never get there. My problem with perfection is my inability to recognize it. If God gave me the power to become anything or anybody I ought to be right now, I would be like a blind dog in a butcher shop. 
I wouldn't have any idea who and what I ought to be. Ought to be. But I've been stumbling, to, and believe me, there hadn't been a single day in the 19 years between May of 90 and now that if you had asked me, Don, are you doing this six and seven thing well enough that it's doing any good, that I would have said, yeah, I think I may have nailed it today. Every day has been stumbling, falling down 50 or 100 times a day, forgetting that there's any such thing as a third step, seventh step, or eleventh step, or any of that stuff, getting knocked over by self-will, getting up and dusting myself off, saying, oops, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry, I fouled up again, excuse me. Taking another couple of steps in the right direction, getting knocked over by self-will, and getting up and dusting myself off and going on. And I used to think that everything, every time that happened, that was an interruption of my spiritual growth. I know now that that process is the only spiritual growth of which I'm capable and my God doesn't require perfection of me. He or she doesn't even require consistency. My God seems to be tickled to death with persistence, just getting up and keeping on stumbling in that right direction. The things that happened are unbelievable. As I said, Sharon and I have been married, uh, been married 18 years, and Sharon and I don't argue. Um, now, I sponsor some guys that are psychologists and counselors, and they tell me that it's not healthy to have a relationship where you don't argue. And I tell them that they are welcome to their healthy relationships. I'm just going to wallow in my illness. Thank you. I'm doing, <laughs> doing quite fine with that. In fact, with the arguing, there's nothing in this book, and I love every word in this book. There's nothing in here I love more than the part that nothing would have pleased us so much as to write a book that would stir no controversy. I do not believe controversy has any worthwhile part in my recovery whatsoever. And God has been very good to me in that regard. I've never at one time had an emotional reaction to how anybody else does a tradition. Never one time. I've seen a lot of things that I go, hmm, wouldn't be the thing for me to do it that way. But I've never had that feeling, my God, he's going to destroy Alcoholics Anonymous. Somebody's got to do something about him. And I think God just anointed me. Uh, <laughs> I believe Alcoholics Anonymous is a big tent. That doesn't mean that I don't believe fervently in things like singleness of purpose. I believe in those things greatly, but I believe more than anything in something we'll get to if I ever get to step 10, I believe in love and tolerance. I, that's our code. And I believe efficiency and responsibility are wonderful things, and I believe they have a very great spiritual aspect to them. But the book doesn't say efficiency and responsibility are our code. The book says love and tolerance of others is our code. And tolerance. I had to learn some lessons with regard to tolerance. I thought I was tolerant from the get-go in Alcoholics Anonymous. I realize now that I had tolerance confused with a high threshold for aggravation. <laughs> I thought as long as what you were doing was sort of irritating to me, but I could shrug it off and go on that that was being tolerant. I realize now that tolerance is not an issue until I find the situation intolerable. Till every fiber of my being screams, my God, that's awful. We can't put up with this under any circumstances. That's when tolerance becomes an issue. It's just like forgiveness. If you cut me off in traffic or you maybe don't come up and hug me or, or, or say something that, that makes me think you didn't enjoy my talk, I'll be a lot more comfortable if I forgive you, but I don't have to forgive you. I'm not going to die over that. I may be uncomfortable for half an hour, and then I may think about it a little bit for a day or two, but, but that's not going to kill me. <laughs> but really, it's not. On the other hand, you molest my child. You steal my retirement. You kill one of my loved ones, and I better forgive you. All I have to forgive is the unforgivable, and all I have to tolerate is the intolerable. You see, I thought I was a greatly forgiving person because I, I was up to a line. I was gracious, and I'd forgive you and go right on. But if you stepped over that line, damn you, I'd not even try to forgive. And I realize now that as long as I'm there, I'm not partially forgiving. I'm totally unforgiving because I have reserved to myself the areas in which to forgive. Behind that, I learned another great lesson. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is my action. 
if I act out forgiveness to you, I have forgiven you regardless of what's going on in my brain and my gut. You see, I thought it again. I think it's all about what I feel. But at the end of the meeting this morning, we'll join hands and say the Lord's Prayer. And I'll ask God to forgive me by precisely the same standard that I forgive my fellow man. Well, it would be nice this morning if God's thinking, you know, Don's always been a nice guy, and I really like him. It's been a real joy to me to save his life and give him all these wonderful things in the last 28 years of sobriety. That'd be nice. But it could be that God's up there saying, I don't know why Don has just always really pissed me off. He, uh, I got something wrong. The ego and that little smart aleck attitude and that drawl just makes me want to squish him like a bug. Uh, and I'd do that if it wasn't God. But after all, I'm God, so I guess I've got to act like God and act like I'm forgiving the little clown. I'll wind up in the same spot as if God was feeling all nice and forgiving toward me. So if I act out forgiveness to you, it doesn't make any difference what I feel in my heart. Now, as a corollary there, if I keep acting it out, I'll, I'll get a lot of peace in my heart. I'll get, a lot of, I'll get a lot of relief in my heart. But if I act out the forgiveness to you, regardless of what I'm feeling and thinking, and God gives me just exactly what I gave you, I'm going to be just fine. Because like everything else, it's not about what I'm thinking and feeling. It's about what I do. That's all that goes into the record book. And I had that completely backwards. Um, and I don't know how I got, I got off on that, but anyway, I did. Uh, <laughs> but all, all these wonderful things happened. My, uh, my, my banks, they wouldn't even let me have a checking account. No major bank in Louisville would let me have a checking account when I came back to Louisville sober in 83. Have given me really unwise lines of unsecured credit. You know, just really totally unwise on their part. Uh, <laughs> the bar association that kicked me out so loudly and embarrassingly ha ha has truly honored me until it's embarrassing. Uh, uh, they, they have. They 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 put me on a kid committee to interview people that want to be judges and and vote on whether they're qualified. They made me chair of that committee. They made me a master of that in in of court. Uh, they uh, they made me pro bono lawyer of the year. Now Jerry knows what that is, and and I assure you that the first ten years I practiced law, nobody thought about Don Major and pro bono in the same breath. And, and God has a great sense of humor. Uh, about four years ago, I was sitting in the barber chair, and my cell phone rang. It was the president of the state bar, and he said, "Don, uh, we have got a vacancy on the ethics committee." The, the first 10 years I practiced law, the only people I was more afraid of than the State Bar Ethics Committee were the IRS and the FBI, I assure you. Uh, but at any rate, um, we have gotten all that, and we've got a little time left, so I'm going to now try to follow directions with God's help <laughs> and talk a little bit about uh, the steps. And I do want to say Bill referred to the penicillin thing, and that's an analogy that, that helped save my life, too. When uh, the folks in Nashville, after I'd gotten my, my gift of, uh, of the first little bit of teachability or humility I had, uh, and I'd you know, explained to them I'd already read the big book, they said they knew that, that I'd been quoting it to them and criticizing the literary style while I'd been dying. Uh, they explained to me it wasn't a philosophy book, that it was a simple instruction manual for my actions, and that if I wanted to live, I'd come back to that book like a little child. And I'd start at the front cover and go through it line for line, looking for nothing to learn, memorize, argue, distinguish, or anything else, but looking for what it says do. That's where they explained to me that the steps are the only program of recovery. I'm not in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous unless I'm somewhere in the process of doing steps one through nine the way the book says do them in order to reach a state of recovery, or having done that, I'm doing the work on a daily basis that is 10, 11, and 12 that gets me my daily reprieve from this thing, unless I'm somewhere in that process, I may very well be a member in good standing of the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. If I've got a desire to stop drinking, I am. But I'm not in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not in the program of recovery. And I won't have any healing of what's really wrong. That ego disorder, that inability to be comfortable inside myself, letting how I feel be the most important thing in the universe. The only relief I'll get from that is through those steps. And that was when those guys explained to me what Bill was referring to, that the steps are the prescription for alcoholism. They work on alcoholism just like penicillin works on an infection. 
if I've got an infection that's going to kill me if it's not treated, but will respond to penicillin, I don't need to understand all the ins and outs of my infection. I don't need to drive my friends in the medical community wild, won't know where I got it in the full nature of it. Uh, I don't need to understand one single thing about how penicillin works in the human body. I don't even need to believe that that little bottle of pills can take care of all these terrible things wrong with magnificent me. And here's the real kicker. I don't even need to want to take the pills. If I've got the infection and I take the pills as directed, I'll get just fine. Thank you. And it was explained to me that that's exactly the way these steps work on, will, will work on alcoholism. If I'll do it, what I'm supposed to do now. Please don't misunderstand. That doesn't happen as a result of merit or as a result of my hard work. Bob mentioned it and, and other speakers have mentioned it, uh, and it's real important to me. These steps are not a psychological process. Now, I believe you'll get some psychological side effects, but I believe if you're doing these steps trying to figure out, oh, let's see what I'm going to do out of it and let me use my brain and let's do it this way, I believe your, your results are apt to be terribly limited. I believe they are. I believe it isn't until we come like a little child and say, Mom, Dad, I don't know. But I'm going to do like a little child with one of these follow the dots pictures. I don't know what the picture is. But I'm going to go from dot to dot just as you tell me with that spark of the divine inside me. And we're going to let the picture emerge. And I believe that what's of value is the humility and the willingness to follow the directions. It isn't my brain that does it. I went to Cherry. My original sponsor was Cherry Carpenter from Nashville, Tennessee. And I went to Cherry when I was about three or four months old and said, Oh, Cherry, it's not working. I'm trying to pray in the morning. My brain's spinning. I, I can't remember the last word. I just tried to pray. And, and I tried to look at the meditation books. And, and I can't remember the last word. I just tried to read. And it's not working. And Cherry said, Don, I don't know whether you're ever going to get this or not. He said, let's examine this deal with, uh, uh, with regard to the prayer. Are you under the impression that God is unaware of your needs unless you articulate it precisely? <laughs> he said, actually, Don, I believe in your case it's far more malignant than that. I think you actually believe you're going to persuade God to do something God wouldn't do otherwise if you stated it convincingly enough. He said, you dummy, the only thing that's of any value whatsoever is your willingness to humble yourself before your God and say please and thank you. It doesn't make any difference whether your brain lets you remember the last word or not. And he said, with regard to these meditation books, haven't you gotten it through your head yet? You're not going to learn anything that's going to help, help you? That this deal is not a learning process, it's a doing process. said, so the only thing that's of value is your willingness to take the time and the effort to open up those books when you really don't want to, when your brain's just spinning and when you've got all your big deals going on and you know you be doing, need to be doing all other things. The exercise of the humility of doing the action is what's of value. And I believe that with all my heart. Uh, Cherry taught me that the first nine steps are the entire program of recovery. That once we have done the first nine steps, we should be at a state of recovery. However, he explained that for most of us, that lasts about six and a half seconds. Uh, because, because what has happened is that the first nine steps have, for the first time in our life, deflated our ego. But never be concerned about the ego. It will reinflate itself, believe me. The, the human ego is the most resilient entity in this universe, as far as I know. It will reinflate itself under any and all circumstances. Now, I'm finally going to talk about what I'm supposed to talk about, 10 and 11. Uh, you know, I have trouble. Oh, oh words. I, no, I'm not yet. I want to tell you one more thing about words because, <laughs> but because the, 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 this word changed my life, and the word is attitude. First few months I was sober, you know, people tell me, you know, you've got to have an attitude of gratitude. Don, if you want to, if you want to live, you've got to change your attitude. Well, you know what I'm doing. I'm flipping around inside trying to find all the buttons to change the way I think and feel because I was convinced that my attitude was my mindset and how I felt about something or somebody. That was just, that was my attitude. And what I found out was that was totally beyond my control. I absolutely could not change my mindset and the way I felt and thought about anything or anybody. Cherry Carpenter finally sent me to a particular dictionary, and that always really ticked me off because I knew I was smarter than Cherry. But 
But he sent me to a particular dictionary to look up attitude. And the one that I looked up, the first def definition has nothing to do with what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. It's a term from geometry and aviation. It is angle of approach. And my angle of approach toward you or anything else in this world doesn't have anything to do with what I'm thinking or feeling. It's how I act toward you or anything else in this world. Now, the magic in that was that in that instant, my attitude went from something totally beyond my control to something totally within my control, regardless of what was going on with my mind and my, and, and, and my heart. I could act right. I could do the angle of approach that was correct. Now, but step 10, uh, I will tell you that I have a lot of trouble reading the big book. And it's not because I have trouble reading. The reason I have trouble reading the big book is I already know what it says. <laughs> and if you already know what something says, there's not much chance you're going to get a whole lot out of it. Like the parts of the big book that are parts of my morning meditation, I say I'll read them in the mornings when I do that. I glance at them, my brain registered, oh yeah, and we go right on. About one time in a thousand, God will give me the grace, that moment of clarity, to actually see what the ink says on the paper. And I am talking about steps 10, 11, and 12 now. I know Joe is going to give us step 12 and going to do it beautifully. Uh, but I'm talking about the maintenance steps. Um, because I was certain that the book said that my daily reprieve from this incurable, progressive, and fatal thing is contingent on my spiritual condition. And that's not what the book says. Thank God. It's another one of those light switch things. Because, you see, I know that the rest of the speakers here with all this time, uh, I know they always never have a ripple and have reached a state of never-ending serenity. I, and I know these folks well enough to know that that is true. But it hadn't with me. I still wake up with the brain spinning sometimes. I still wake up so scared, so obsessed with myself and my problem that I can't remember the last word I just tried to pray. I feel cut off from God. I feel cut off from you. I feel cut off from everything. And I feel like and that my spirits will condition is crap. If my daily reprieve were contingent on that, if it was contingent on the way I am, I'd be in mortal danger of being struck drunk and dying a mad dog death that day. But thank God that's not what the book says. It is the maintenance of the spiritual condition. I've got an automobile. And that automobile is sitting in a garage in Louisville, and it has some condition right now. And there's absolutely nothing I can do to wave a wand and transform the condition of that automobile uh, at once. On the other hand, there's a process of maintaining that automobile. And that is action over which I have 100% control. So the bottom line is real simple. I don't get my daily reprieve based on how I am that day. I get my daily reprieve based on what I do that day. So on those days when I wake up feeling all cut off and, 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 and so unspiritual, if I make myself get on my knees, if I make myself look at the meditation books, make myself make a gratitude list, although I'm making a list of what a person would be grateful for if they had any sanity, you know, because as far as feeling greatly grateful, I can't even muster it up for my eyes that morning, you know. Uh, when I go to work, uh, I can be involved in my big deals, and alcoholism is a disease of big deals, and that is particularly true in me. I've been eaten up with big deals all my life, and the truth is, any time I make a big deal out of anything other than God in these 12 steps, what I'm really making a big deal out of is me. And when I do that, I'm back into ego, and I'm back into alcoholism. And over the years, I've had to learn that that includes those things that it's just un-American not to make a big deal out of like my children, my health, my money, my sex life. But you see, you can come to me with your problems with your health, money, children, sex life, and I'd be St. Francis. I can tell you, oh, it's going to be just fine, Bob. Just listen to that little divine spark in you, Bob, that takes the next stitch, and God will take care of the pattern. And then I wonder why poor Bob can't see the forest for the trees and just do the thing as he goes off. You let the same thing happen to me, and oh, my God, it's the end of the world. That's because it's mine, because it's my children, my health, my this, that, and the other. So I need to remember that any time I make a big deal out of anything other than God and these 12 steps, 
what I'm really doing is crippling myself. Like with sponsoring folks, if I make a huge deal out of it and I'm responsible for whether they live or die, I can't sponsor many people. It'll break my back. Practicing law, if I've got such big deals that I'm afraid to do an action, I can't do much, can we, Jerry? We have to just take that next stitch. We have to forget the number of zeros. We have to forget the potential penalty. We have to do what's the next right thing under any circumstances and just walk through. But believe me, that doesn't come to me naturally. So I'm talking now about the 10th step, that, and this is one of these mornings when I woke up spiritually bankrupt as best I can tell. But I've done my prayers. I've done my, 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 my reading as best I can. I'm at the office. I'm in the middle of one of my big deals and one of my more aggravating sponsees calls. Let, let's say... Say his name's John. I don't think I'm sponsoring John right now. And, and even though I've told John, just like I've told anybody that I ever agreed to sponsor, that for me to give advice on either finances or romances really ought to be a felony. Uh, but uh, uh, d despite that, Joe wants to talk about the girl for the tenth time in the last 48 hours. And I hadn't got time to talk to Joe about the girl. For God's sake, I've got a big deal going on, and there's nothing I can tell him anyway, and every fiber of my being wants to tell the Megan, to, God, tell him I'll call him back, Meg, take, take a telephone, take a number. But what I can do, I can say those prayers that are magic. I can say that will be done. I'm no longer running the show. And Lord, please let me seek to love, comfort, and understand John rather than to be loved, comforted, and understood by him. And I can tell Megan, put him through. And I can pick up the phone and I can say, good morning, John. What can I do for you this morning, buddy? And I can keep running those things through my mind and a series of miracles will happen. The first miracle is that God will make me what I'm not. God will make me a listener. If I run those prayers through long enough, I will truly be listening to John instead of my brain running on all these tracks of what I'm going to say to him, what I'm going to do on totally unrelated things. I'll truly become a listener for John. Another miracle, Chuck Chamberlain talks about this one. Uh, John and that girl in which when the phone rang, I had about as little interest as anything I can imagine. When I truly am able to listen to John, it will become for that moment the most interesting thing on earth because anything that I will give my entire inch interest, attention, and love to will become the most interesting thing on earth. And Sandy last night said another thing that was from Chuck that I just love. Hey, if you're not having fun with this thing, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, Chuck said that, and I found it true. It's true of all of life. If it's hard, I'm doing it wrong. God did not mean to make hard terms with me. I'm the one that makes the hard terms. I'm the one that makes all this stuff tough. If, I'm, if it's hard, I'm simply doing it wrong. And on another miracle on the love, comfort, and understand, I have found out that for me it is a spiritual absolute. I'm talking about no play in this. It's absolute. If any part of me is motivated by getting you to love, comfort, and understand me, it is impossible, impossible for me to feel loved, comforted, and understood to my satisfaction. It cannot happen. If you do precisely what I thought I wanted you to do before you're finished, I will have changed that. And even if I don't get it changed in time, I'll find out that doesn't even make a dent on that hole in my belly that I'm trying to fill up with you. See, when I try to fill up that hole in my belly with people, places, things, situations, anything, it doesn't make any difference how those things work out. The spiritual mistake is I've tried to seek my comfort in things that will not support my comfort until I realize that it simply won't work for me. But at any rate, and I'm going through that day at noon, there's a, a meeting at a little token club where my home group, the Calm Down meeting, is on the Calm Down group is on Wednesdays. Uh, and I know everybody practically goes to that meeting. The acoustics are terrible. As Joe over there knows, well, I can't hear thunder anyway. Uh, I, can't, I can't understand one word out of five that's, uh, that's said in there. Great big discussion made in a big Barney room. Doesn't matter because I know them all. I heard what they were going to say anyway. Uh, and, and I'm real busy. I've, I've got my big deals going on. And, and clearly, clearly it would be stupid to go to the meeting. And make me go to myself go to the meeting anyway. I remember what my friend Billy Hogan and I say to one another, that we are too busy not to go to meetings. 
we are too busy not to go to meetings. There's something about AA meetings that somehow magically expands time and energy. I'm not at all sure how that works, but that works some sort of magic way. And I go to that meeting with the right, with the right question. See, the wrong question for me is always, what am I getting out of this? Let me tell you why that's the wrong question. I don't care what it is I ask it about. You let me ask it and give it about 30 seconds deep thought, and the answer is not enough. So it's just the wrong question. And it's the same paradox as on the love comfort understand. The only time it is possible for me to feel like I'm getting what I want to get out of something is when I've laid aside my demands to get anything out of it and I'm truly trying to see what I can bring to it. And then that same miracle happens with the love, comfort, and understand when I can get that to work, I will wind up loved, comforted, and understood beyond my wildest dreams. Of course, what happens, I like that, and I say, I think I'll hold on to that a little while. <laughs> it's gone <laughs> as soon as I try to hold on to it. So I have to start over again. The same with that. That's when I get something out of things is when I've laid that aside. And on that day, going through that day, I'm absolutely guaranteed I'm not going to get drunk. I believe that with all my heart because I've taken the action that is the maintenance of my spiritual condition regardless of how I feel. Of course, the flip side of that is I get up feeling so sanctimonious that I think God and I are going to join hands and go out and drift through the ether and merge with the tower or something, you know. And, and when it comes time to consider praying, I can think, why should I get on my knees? My whole life is a prayer, for God's sake. Uh, and, 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 you know, all of those things and going on through, and I can be engaged in, in higher spiritual concentra- uh, contemplation when Joe calls to babble about the girl, and, and I can feel so warmly toward George, but tell the receptionist, I, I'll have to get with him later. I'm in spiritual graduate school right now. Uh, and on that day, I can get drunker and cooter ground. Even though I feel like I'm just as spiritual as I can be, I'm not doing the action that is the maintenance of my spiritual condition that day, and that's what gets me my daily reprieve. Um, I already mentioned that, the, the, well, the tenth step itself. Um, the first paragraph on the tenth step mentions the word continue three times. Uh, and that is really difficult for me. I've got friends that say, and I think I may agree with them, that that word in the 10th step, continued, is the most important word in the 12 steps. Because I've always been really good at starting stuff. I've always been really, really good at it. But to keep on doing that same thing over and over again is really difficult for me. And that's what I need to do. The word continue is mentioned three times in the first paragraph. Um, the step, of course, said continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Um, to me, continuing to take personal inventory means as I go through the day, take inventory. It also means it's a safety net under my fourth step. Mildred and Bob talked about, or not Mildred and, and this Bob talked about the fourth step, and, and I think I got out of both of them. Do the best you can, but give up on trying to do a perfect one. Nobody ever did a fourth, perfect fourth step. Get it done. Uh, and that's one of the purposes of the tenth step, is there is a safety net. When it occurs to me that I missed something on my fourth step, I can use the tenth step to clean that up. Uh, it also is the end of the day on page 86 before I retire running through that checklist of what's going on. For me, it has been periodic, full, written inventories that look just like a fourth step. I do not call them fourth steps because Cherry Carpenter told me you only do the first nine steps once. He also, what he didn't want, he didn't want me married down the rest of my life being a poor little old sick recovering alcoholic that never was going to get well because he knew if he let me grab hold of that, I'd be sitting around a clubhouse somewhere at 20 years sober playing euchre, whining about them earth people. I can't deal with them folks. I might get drunk. They don't understand me. He wanted me to understand if I've done those first nine steps where the book says do them and I'm living on 10, 11, and 12, I ought to be at least as capable of dealing with life on life's terms as a person who never had alcoholism. Um, <coughs> but at any rate, lost my train of thought. How about that one? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if Chair, something else Chair told me about Step 10 is that the word promptly on admitting that I was wrong uh, is only there for my comfort. 
He said, if I want to be comfortable eventually, I can eventually admit I'm wrong. But if I want to be comfortable promptly, I better promptly admit I'm wrong and then go on from there. And I already mentioned that step, step 10 is where the AA code is, uh, and I love the AA code, love and tolerance of others. And, and connected with that, um, I believe in tough love. And Sharon can tell you, sometimes I, I'll do tough love. But if I've got any doubt whatsoever whether what is appropriate is tough love or kindness, I'm going to err on the side of kindness. I simply am. Uh, I think that's the tone of the book. And I guess the bottom line is I would rather have on my tombstone, Don was kind, than to have on my tombstone, Don didn't take any crap. <laughs> I just whole lot rather have on there. Don, Don, Don was kind. <laughs> step 11, absolutely love step 11 to death up until May of 1990 when I, I fell totally in love with step 6 and 7. Step 11 was where it was with me, just absolutely where it was. Uh, uh, when I first began to come to believe, I remember asking, Cherry, how do I start this conscience? You sought to improve <coughs> Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us, the power to carry it out. So I asked Cherry, uh, Cherry, uh, how do I begin in, in a day trying, and how and when do I begin trying to get this conscious contact going? And uh, he said, Don, it says here in the book, says, on awakening, where you think about the 24 hours here, and we ask God to direct our thinking, especially that it, that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. And this is exactly what Cherry told me. I'm not trying to be gross or tacky. He said, Don, if that had meant after you go to the bathroom, it would have said in there, after we peed, we ask God to direct our thinking. He said, it doesn't say that. It says, on awakening. And it says, you better train yourself to run through your head as soon as your eyes fly open. God, please direct my thinking, especially let it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. And he said, there are a couple of really good reasons for that. He said, the first one, that's what the book says do, and my God, you need to follow directions. He said, the second one is that you are perfectly capable of getting crazy enough between the bed and the bathroom to ruin the rest of your life. Um, so over the years... It has happened that sometime pretty darn soon after those eyes fly open, that goes through my head. I started getting on my knees and praying in April of 81 as a pure act and as if thing had no idea it would work. A uh, miracle, the second step began to happen. I began to come to believe. As far as I know, I haven't missed a morning or a night getting down there. Um, that's thousands of mornings and nights uh, that I've gotten down there every morning. Now, I'm not telling you that to tell you how good I am. I'm telling you that for an entirely different reason. Uh, at least half the time, I hadn't really wanted to. Uh, there have been a whole bunch of times when I, c I could have gotten a written medical excuse that I didn't feel like getting down there. I've had a lot of surgery sober, and, and, and it hurts to roll out of those hospital beds and get on your knees. A uh, whole bunch of times, I could have gotten affidavits from lawyers and judges that I didn't have time to get down there. And then a lot of those mornings I was talking about when the brain's spinning and I'm scared to death, it's obvious to me it's not doing any good when I get down there. But I've gotten down there every morning, every night. Something's worked every single day. Uh, and I, and I read part of my morning meditations, reading the seventh step prayer, the third step prayer, seventh step prayer, page 86, 87, and 88, and reading the prayer of St. Francis from page 99 in the 12 and 12. And that's where the 12 and 12 talks about the 11th step, so that's very much a part of my 11th step work. In fact, my 11th step daily prayers are that will be done. I'm no longer running the show, and Lord, please let me seek to love, comfort, and understand. Um, I have done pretty darn well. I haven't missed a morning or night on the praying, and probably throughout my sobriety I batted, batted seven or 800 on doing the morning stuff. I've, I have to admit that here lately I've been in the slump, <laughs> but and I pay for it every time I do. Every time I get in the slump on doing my full morning uh, reading and writing, I pay for it. I get more uncomfortable. But I've done pretty well with that throughout sobriety and done pretty well with the end of the day, too, with running through my head that page 86 inventory. Where I have trouble is the other 98% of the 11th step. See, I think it's easy to get to thinking that the 11th step is just the morning and the evening. That's about 2% of it. 98% of it is carrying it through the day, and the book tells us exactly what to do. 
It says all day, every day, regardless of what's going on, we constantly remind ourselves we're no longer running the show. Now, why do you suppose that Bill used the word constantly remind ourselves? Do you suppose it is because we are constantly trying to run the show? I think in my case, that's precisely why that word was used. Uh, and, and then the book puts it, puts it in quotation marks. There's no question I'm supposed to say that. Humbly saying to myself many times each day, that will be done. That will be done. So my 11th step mantra is, that will be done. I'm no longer running the show. Lord, please let me seek to love, comfort, and understand. And I already talked about the magic of those when I was talking about my phone call from old Joe about the girl. Uh, they are the most magic things in any human relations that I have ever found. When I will remember to say those before any human contact, whether it's waking my wife up with a kiss, talking to my child on the phone, dealing with a client, getting ready to argue a very difficult case in front of a forum where a lot of things is riding on it, if I will remember to run over and over through my mind, I will be done. I'm no longer running the show. And let me seek to love, comfort, and understand here rather than to be loved, comforted, and understood. It never goes wrong. Not always the way I'd want it to go, but it always works darn well. I found out God's a lot better lawyer than I. When I go down to that law office and try to look good and be, and be honest, you know, and, and, and be hardworking and try to outthink, outperform, and outmaneuver and make money and win cases and protect myself and cover my butt, I wind up in the snake pit every time. Just like Chuck Chamberlain says, I wind up in the snake pit. But when I go down there and lay all that crap aside and try to love, comfort, and understand, and try to help God's kids do what they need to have done for free and for fun because I want to. When I stop trying to take care of me, see, my illness is self-centeredness. I cannot effectively treat it by obsession on self. And, Lord, I try to dress obsession on self up in psychology and spirituality. There just ought to be some way. I mean, I love obsession on self so well, nothing else makes me so exquisitely miserable. It, it just seems like I ought to be able to successfully obsess on self. But I can't do it. My only relief, my only recovery is when I quit trying to take care of me and when I start trying to take care of you and when I let God take care of me. And God take care of my needs. And when I do that, it's unbelievable. That's when the young lawyers light up and want to try cases with me. Just, just want to do it. They just want to be involved. They don't want anybody. They just want to go through a trial with me. And, and, and I don't have anything to tell them. I'm not a great lawyer. I haven't raised my voice in the courtroom over 20 years. Uh, and by the way, on the, on the uh, conflict and the controversy thing, if you have caught me arguing with anybody in the last 25 years, somebody was paying me. I will not argue with you for nothing and make my belly hurt. I say it's, it's, God has delivered me, thank goodness, from that terrible need to be right. You know, I just don't much care whether I'm right or not. I, the two kind of lightning bugs. One's trying to set the world on fire and the other's trying to keep his butt warm. And I sure want to be the second part kind, I'll tell you. When I will do that, and to me the book is real clear, that when I will go through the day saying that will be done, I'm no longer running the show, and praying to love, comfort, and understand in my case, it is those things that I believe that the 11th step promises on page 88 are tied to. And let me read you, they're real short, the 11th step promises. You know, the, the, what we call the promises, the 8th and ninth step promises, are beautiful. But nobody ever meant for those to be the promises of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're just some of the promises. I think somebody counted them one time, decided you could argue there are 12 of them. You can also argue there are 11 of them or 13 of them. And just be aware that this book is full of promises. Third step promises are beautiful, including I'm going to be reborn. And here's the 11th step promises. When I do that, when I carry through my day with me, that will be done. I'm no longer running the show. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily, for we're not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. 
It works. It really does. That's the shortest paragraph in the big book, by the way. It works. It really does. And what that's telling me is this is not some sort of spiritual, uh, only spiritual, ethereal thing. This is a practical tool in my life. When I will do that, it'll work in my marriage. It'll work in my law practice. It'll work in all of my human relations. It'll work in everything I do when I carry that through the day. Thank you for having me so much. I love you. And Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing.